So I always wanted to be wealthy. But something clicked when I got into the company I work for now. It stopped being a want and it became a must. And for me, yeah. I saw the possibilities and I said, I'll do everything it takes to get there. While I'm in car sales, I said, why do you do insurance? Mm. And he said something that changed my life forever. He said, when you sell a car, you get paid once. When you sell a house, you get paid once. When you sell a product, you get paid once. When you sell an insurance product, you get paid forever. I left my wife, four kids, mm. and my buddy Nate Offer called me and shared this. He said, you're still doing insurance. I said, yeah, he didn't know I was homeless. He said, listen, guys, this is not that hard. It's going to be one of the hardest things you've ever done, but it's not that hard. He said it again. You can make it if you just don't quit. And I started writing on the piece of paper, just don't quit. And I look around, and this is the wealthiest guy in the room talking. Nobody else is writing. And I'm writing it again, just don't quit. And I look down, and there's tears streaming out of my eyes. Just don't quit. Just don't, I'll make it if I just don't quit. I can beat 95%. I can beat the 92% if I just don't quit. And I'm writing that down, I'm crying, tears are soaking my, and I said, I'm gonna make it here. And I finally in my life made up my mind to not quit something, because here's the thing, Cody, I quit everything I ever started. Man, do I have a story for you guys today. You have to pay attention and listen to everything we're gonna talk about. This man's story is insane. It'll, it'll be one of the best interviews we've ever done. I'm confident in that. Welcome back to another interview of Insurance Influencers. This dude is an influencer in the insurance industry. He won't say it about himself, but I'm, do, I'm telling you, Marlon Faulkner is a stud. Thank you for being a part of this, bro. Man, thank you so much. I am, uh, I'm excited to be here and uh, just getting to know you over the last, I guess, month. It's only been a month, but I feel like I've known you for like 20 years. Yeah. Uh, has been incredible. So just the fact I came up to see you today and you thank threw you. me in the chair and, and wanted to interview me and uh, I just a pleasure to know you and just to be in great company and Thank you. just excited to get to know you Appreciate so much you, better, but um, excited about this. Dude, I think it's my you, first man. interview. What? <laughs> what? We're, 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 we're releasing Marlon Faulkner today, dude. I mean, how sick is that? So we met at Nate Offert's event mm -hmm. in Dallas. Nate's a good buddy of ours. We got to yeah. give him a shout out. What's you up, know? Nate? He, he, you beat him here. Yeah. You got here I, in I, that chair before he did. I did get here you know? first. Do you think you just act faster than him? Like, what's the deal? Well, I'm not going to say that, but I'm just <laughs> going to say I did get here first. I live about an hour and a half from you, and so I, I yeah, made yeah, it happen, yeah. man. So Totally. It's, it's shame on him. That's what's impressive about you. I have a way of complimenting people to start something like this. Like, you did. You stole my thunder and did it to me. Um, something about you that when I was listening to your story, and we're gonna go through it a little bit today. I was like, I gotta know, I gotta get hang out with that dude. I gotta get to know that dude. Mm -hmm. And you and you've been you've been the exact same way. You know, you've been you text me every morning. You're like, you you show up. You're coming here. Like, uh, where, where have you always been that way? To you, where you're like craving for more, and you just like take action and do it. You're like, I'm just I'm doing it, man. Is mm -hmm. that has that always been that way for you? No, it you know, not not really. Um, and we'll get into my past a little bit. Yeah, but the lack that I had growing up from my dad, my mom really tried hard, but the lack that I got, um, when I feel like I meet someone who's got a lot of love, a lot of energy, I wanna be around them. Mm. Just no different than a kid's gonna um, really gravitate towards a teacher that's really showing them love or someone else. Yeah. So I, I don't necessarily do that all the time, but when I'm around people that I feel love and feel a, a genuine connection with yeah. people that are authentic, kind of like yourself. Thanks, I want to be around people like that because I know it makes me better. Did you ever think you'd be making the kind of money you're making today? <laughs> um, I always dreamed that I would. Is that a safe answer? It is. Like everyone dreams, everyone wants um, money. I remember being a kid, my mom asked me what I want to do and I said, I want to be a doctor. I, I watched the Cosby mm. show at them. It was the only show. I lived in Europe. So we had one channel wow. and uh, it was AFN, Armed Forces Network. My dad was in the military. And okay. so you would watch like Rawhide, MASH, then the Cosby show, then a football game. So <laughs> I remember watching the Cosby show and I saw someone who generally was a great family man, which I, I really didn't have that at home. Someone who took care of things, someone who was the answer person. Mm. So I always wanted to be wealthy. But something clicked when I got into the company I work for now. Yep. Um, where it stopped being a want and it became a must. And for me, okay. I saw the possibilities and I said, I'll do everything it takes to get there. 
not only do I can I want it, but now I can have it. And for the first time in my life, I turned the mirror back and said, the only way you can have it is if you change. Mm. And I never did that. I always blame people about the color of my skin, not having enough money, um, having a raw deal. Um, I always blamed everybody else. Wow. And for the first time in my life, I met some some men, some mentors that said, man, it's, it's on you. And to be honest, I hated them for it. Mm. To, to be honest, I, I hated them because when, when you don't like yourself and someone tells you you're the problem, um, that, that's hard to deal with. That's hard. I didn't sleep well with that, but I saw the, I saw the opportunity and, and man, I ran with it and it's been un freaking believable. Dude, it has, it has. Why don't, why don't you, for those that don't know, because I'm, I've, as I keep asking questions, it's, it's going to come, the story's going to come up. Why don't you share who is Marlon Faulkner? Yeah. Um, well, I'm still learning that because I'm 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 changing. I'm I'm growing. But who who yeah. was I? I was a, a military brat. I grew up in Europe. My dad was in the armed forces, and um, was a really um, hardened guy. I, I, I tell people not not in a bad way, but I felt like him and Satan were best friends. Mm. <laughs> so mm. he was really hard. Um, he never told me he loved me ever, unless he was drinking. Um, he, you know, it came out a few years later on, on my. Um, Wow. On my 13th birthday, um, found out that my mom had come out that he, he molested my sisters. And um, my mom had a knife. I'll never forget. It was on my birthday. And I walked upstairs and my mom had a knife on the bed. And I asked her what was wrong. And, and she, she said, your dad's been molesting your sisters. And, and, and she talked to me about what he'd been doing to me. And and uh, I, I told her it was all true. And so... Um, when you're a kid, you don't know what normal is. Like we were, my dad, we were poor because my dad was an alcoholic. I didn't know what poor was. I just know I didn't have what other people had, mm-hmm. and sat by my mom all night um, because I didn't want her to kill my dad because I didn't understand. But the next day, we packed up all of our stuff and we left, my sisters and I. And that was the last time I'd seen my dad in a long time. So um, that that was kind of growing up. Um, I didn't have much. I was always the center of attention um, because I wasn't getting attention home. So I wanted to be the center of attention at school. So I was a straight A student, but my teachers hated me because I talked all the time. I was a troublemaker. I was the guy that the teachers dread because I was a straight A student, but I did everything because I didn't want to go home. I was in drama. I played football. I played basketball. I was uh, in choir. I was in drama. I did it all because I didn't want to go home wow. to face what I had to face. And so um, going into life, I knew I wanted to go to college because like I said, I wanted to be a doctor. I was pre-med my first year of college, um, I started to find myself and realize that um, I didn't like the person I'd been. I, I thought life was unfair. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started playing the blame game, right? Because we're all young. We have dreams and aspirations right. of doing great things. But I got to college and realized that people had parents that cared about them. People had money. People had cars. People had things that they they got to have. And I, I, I thought, well, why don't I have it? So I started playing the blame game. Yeah. And that took me down a dark path of never having enough, never having um, satisfaction, never being happy. And um, th- that's who I was. That That's the foundation of th- those those things that happened to me and to my sisters. You don't know what normal is. You get mad at the world. You get mad at, at God. But I, I still found a way to find love for people. I just didn't know how to express it. Yeah. So that that's kind of kind of a basis wow. to, to to who it was. I'll never forget. I don't think you've heard the story, but um, <clears throat> there were times when I'll just throw it out there. I, I peed in the bed till I was till later in life. Wow. I was a bedwetter. Yeah. And um, I would pee in my bed, and I would go sleep in my sister's bed. And my sister was a year up for me. She's awesome. There were times that even if I'd pee in my bed, she'd come sleep in my bed. And I didn't realize that was for safety. And um, n- knowing that now, I've always been a protector of what's right. And getting to bring that into the business world has benefited me a lot. Yeah. So that's, I don't know if that's kind of what you wanted to hear. That's, no, that's, kind of, that's a little bit of background to me. I, I don't want people to feel sorry for me. I don't because life is life. There's people that have worse stories, sure. that worse things have happened to. This is just my story. Yeah, This is just the life that I had to live. And a lot of times I wanted to live someone else's life. Looking back, I'm so grateful for the life I lived. And that sounds weird. 
But I'm so grateful that I had to go through those things because it made me stronger. Mm. It made me appreciate the little things. Um, watching the sunrise is something I appreciate. Watching the moon and that is something I appreciate. So I, I appreciate more things to life now that I can get a grasp on the things that happened to me yeah. early on in life. So so let's talk through because you're 43 now. I don't look like it. I mean, no, I can't, dude, you don't I can't look 43. Just my age well, dude, up there. You, you work out every day. I mean, yeah. well, because I've, I, I want to tr- back up to your 20s. Mm-hmm. Who who was Marlon Deering? Let, let's let's say you talked about college a little bit. What, what, what happened? What happened? What happened after college? Well, I, I knew I wanted to make money. I, I switched from a pre med degree to exercise science, and actually had a I had a minor in Bible, okay. and um, because I, I wanted to learn the written word Greek Hebrew, I wanted to learn not what someone else's interpretation was it, but I was in search of myself, so I wanted to search out this deity. So I wanted to do that. Yep. But I knew I loved sports. I played football, basketball in high school. Uh, played a year of college ball, got hurt. Um, so I wanted to change. I changed to exercise science. When I graduated, I didn't know what I was going to do. Like, what do you do with an exercise science degree? I so know. I did what every normal person does that doesn't know what they're going to do. I went and became a coach and a teacher. Yep. <laughs> so yep. um, I love coaching because I love what it could do for for kids who hadn't had hope. I saw mm-hmm. myself in kids. I saw myself in less fortunate people. But I knew I didn't want to teach for the rest of my life because teachers are, are the most underpaid profession in the world. And they need to be the most overpaid. Yeah. And so I was kind of confused because I'm teaching and coaching football. Coached in Florida under uh, awesome coach Bill Kramer at Naples High School. We won the first state championship in school history. Wow. Uh, he just got inducted into the Hall of Fame. But I, I knew I didn't want to do that forever because I wasn't. I wasn't well off. I knew I was created for more. That, that's. The, I want to take a step back. Mm. All those yeah. nights that I lived at home with my parents, all those years I was by myself, all the years of college, if I really thought about it, when I laid my head down, I cried myself to sleep a lot of nights, I always knew I was created for more. Like, what do you, what do you, that's like you have an ego in a pen full of chickens. You know that you're there in a pen and you know you have feathers, but you know you're different. I didn't yeah. know how to explain it, but I knew I was different. I just didn't understand how to get what was in me out. Mm. And so... Um, there was this pull and tear of, of of conflict between my inner thoughts and my outer actions. So being love coaching because I love people, helping people achieve, but I, I knew I was created for greatness. Did you wake up frustrated during times because of that? Because you're like, okay, I knew I'm meant for more. I'm not performing at the level that I know I should be, mm-hmm. and I'm not getting what I know I should be getting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know I go through that, you know. I would say I woke up frustrated because I love coaching. But I just knew it wasn't what I was born to do, right? Yeah. People people go out and work a job from nine to five. I, I even tell people now, I, I wasn't created to sell insurance, but I was created to make a difference. Yep. And so insurance is the tool I get to use to do that. But I, I woke up, um, I wouldn't say frustrated, I woke up anxious. Okay, good. Um, at some point knowing that I wouldn't be doing that anymore, but how would I get from A to Z not knowing how to get there? That was the anxious part of me. Like I know I'm, I know I'm great, yeah. But I know I, I got something special. I know I'm different than that person, and that person, and that person, and that. There's something different in me. But how do you? Get, I, I can see it, but I don't know how to get there. Mm. So it wasn't as much frustration as was anxiety of, I'm going to get there. I don't know how. And I left coaching, and I I came back, and I met my wife. She gets pregnant, and I know I have to enter the workforce. So I go where every person who wants to win and make a lot of money and do sales, I went to a car lot. <laughs> One of the worst ideas car ever. Sales. Yeah, right. I started off in car sales. Here's the thing that changed my life. I played basketball. I had one day off a week, working 60, 70, 80 hours, um, making decent money but no time. And I play basketball. I go to the gym, and I met this guy who was there. Every time I was at the gym, he was at the gym. Didn't matter if I was off on Monday, Tuesday. Wow. He was always there. And he drove this Mercedes. And I'm not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not uh, materialistic. Sure, but sure. I like nice things. And so I noticed that I was driving um, a Nissan Sentra. And he was the same age as me around. He was driving a black Mercedes. So I, being me, I said, what do you do? He said, I'm an insurance. Wow. Well, at the time, I thought, well, I was doing pretty good. I said, well, that, that's awesome. But I'm in car sales. Yeah. But I didn't drive a Mercedes. Do you remember his name? 
I don't remember his name. Dude, I, I want to thank that guy because we wouldn't have met. Well, yeah, absolutely. I need to go back and thank him. I need to buy him another Mercedes. There you but go. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I said, I, you know, when you don't know what you don't know, I said, if well, I'm in car sales, I said, why do you do insurance? Mm. And he said something that changed my life forever. He said, when you sell a car, you get paid once. When you sell a house, you get paid once. When you sell a product, you get paid once. When you sell an insurance product, you get paid forever. And he literally turned and walked mm. off. I never had another conversation with a guy. I knew Joe to be the Mercedes. That's all he said. That's all he said. Oh. He didn't have to say much because he was driving the Mercedes. I was driving the Nissan. <laughs> but when he said that, something in me changed. And it still was, get this, it was still three or four years before I, because I was scared. Now I, anxiety turns to fear because now I know I'm not accomplishing what I'm supposed to accomplish. Yeah. Now I'm scared to go out there and do it because I got a wife and a baby and I, I don't want to fail because I didn't realize that failure was the bridge to success. And so it took me three or four more years, three or four different jobs of trying to do different things before I decided I need to go get my insurance license to get an insurance field. Wow. What age? When I was 24, 25. When you first got your insurance license? My son, my wife was, my son was born. I was 25. My best friend, one of my best friends at the time, I worked at a shoe store in Shawnee, uh, in college and this gentleman started with a company called Primerica. I don't know if I can say that. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. Um, yeah. And I you watched say whatever him, you want on this. Yeah. I watched it Primerica yeah. and uh, people always call it Prime America and it makes it, me mad. Yeah, no, it's, it's not, not Prime yeah, America. Yeah. It's Prime America. That's right. Anyways. Um, Art, Art Williams, right? Art Williams. Started out as A.L. Williams. A.L. Williams. And, and, yeah, yeah. I watched Dude. a buddy of mine who I worked for. He was a manager at a shoe store when I was in college yeah. making 50000 a year to making a few years later, in Prime America, being an RVP and a senior national sales director, making fifty thousand a month. Wow! P people can people can say what they want. That dude is one of the best speakers I've ever heard. Art Williams. Oh my god! Oh, I still listen to this stuff. Woo! You sent me a video the other day. Uh, the Just Do It speech. You can you can YouTube it. Holy crap! That was good. I listen to it once a month because it's it's dude. It's so good. No excuses. Just go do it. Oh. Yeah, exactly. So that so in my twenties, that's where I was. Twenty five years old, I get my license, and I fell miserably. Mm. My best friend at the time uh, got Chris Hines got started with me. He's my college roommate. We get started. We're fired up about Primerica. We're running. We're gunning. I get told no a bunch. I get told yeah. it's a pyramid scheme. I get told, and I quit. Well, why'd you quit? Did you just weren't making sales? What what was what was the primary reason? Um. Well, what I know now is the primary reason was Primerica was never in me. I got gotcha. you. It was just a pursuit of money. Sure. Um, I wasn't making the, obviously I had a wife, baby, frustrated. You're not making money, yeah. go do something else. So I, I did the next logical thing. I went to farmer's insurance. <laughs> okay. I didn't even so, know that either. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been at 15 different insurance companies. Mm -hmm. So you've been at this insurance thing for for a long 19, time, eighteen years. Eighteen years, and I was always the worst. I never made more than thirty thousand a year, ever. Wow! Because there's a lot of people that are that are a part of the ninety two percent that are thinking about quitting. We get people on our YouTube. That's why I love our YouTube channel so mm -hmm. much. We get people on our YouTube channel every day that are like, "Dude, I thought about quitting, and then I saw that interview with mm -hmm. you and Marlon, and I'm not going to quit anymore." Yeah, so here, here's a story I have. So can I say the name of the company I'm with? Please. So I'm with Symmetry Financial yeah. Group. Uh, in my opinion, the best company. Well, it changed my life. Sure. Um, we'll, we'll walk back to where I'm at. This this interview might be an hour because we got a lot That's to cover. That's fine. Yeah, this will um, be good, whatever it is. So um, my wife and I got separated. I wasn't a good husband. I wasn't a good father. I wasn't a good person. And she had put up with so much. And basically... I, I wasn't good. I, I left. I left my wife, four kids. Hmm. And my buddy Nate Offer called me and shared this. He said, you're still doing insurance. I said, yeah, he didn't know I was homeless. Wow. I answered my, listen, I was homeless, but I still had a cell phone. When you, when you say homeless, like. I, I didn't have a home. I was sleeping in my car on friends' couches. I slept with the Salvation Army one night. Um, excuse me, I slept on the street because it was wintertime. I slept in my car. I so was like homeless. like outside when it was cold. I didn't have a home. You no wonder you're the, the discipline that we'll get to later. No wonder you have such freaking discipline. Yeah. It was, uh, so, but I was still married to my wife and I still wanted to, 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 
work things out. I just had to, I, I realized I was the problem again. Remember, it's always going to go back to that. I was the problem. Anything in my life, my weight, the way I look, you know, I, I love Jim Rohn. As, if you wanted something in your life to change, change it. If you want the way you look to change, change it. If you want your money to change, change it. And so I was homeless and Nate Offert called me. I was sitting on my buddy Brian Henson's porch. Him and his wife were arguing because I'd been with them about a week and a half. And she's like, how long is he going to be here? Mm. He doesn't pay bills. He eats our food. He sleeps on the couch. He sleeps late. And Nate calls me. Hey, what's going on? Oh, things are awesome, Nate. (laughs) He said, hey, I want to send you a video about this new company I'm thinking about. He said, you do insurance. I said, absolutely. And... I, he sent me a video. I hung up the phone. I watched it. I started crying. I called him back immediately. He said, I said, I want to get started. Wow. And I got started while Nate was getting his license. There was a conference that was coming up. Nate Alford said, if you don't go to conference, I can't work with you. Mm. Now, this is where I got angry again at, at outside circumstances, not inner turmoil. Nate drives a really nice car, $100,000 car, was living in a Multi, you know, a million. He didn't have the McLaren back. He didn't have the McLaren back in. We'll just say he had the Bentley. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm like, okay, this dude's got money. He wants me to start insurance. He's gonna give me money to go to the conference. Uh, (laughs) Ah. You know what he said? He said you gotta go to conference. You gotta figure it out. And I got angry. I'm homeless, and I have my wife and kids. I don't have any money. I don't have any money. He said, I won't work with you. Now, now, mind you, I've watched this guy make millions of dollars in his lifetime. He's with different network marketing companies, different companies. He drove a Bentley. He's one of the most Lim- impressive people I've ever met. 100%. Like, he's so freaking talented. He's one, he is the most one of the most talented people I've ever met. No doubt. And all I'm thinking is, you want me to work with you in insurance, I, I need a few hundred bucks. And he wouldn't loan it to me. I was upset, but I knew that I watched him make this money, so I had to figure things out, and I'm getting to the point. I said, okay, I'll go to the conference. I sold some stuff to buy a ticket. It was like 100 bucks for the ticket. I didn't have gas money to get there. I didn't have food. My wife and kids left to go to school and work. I went home, and I broke into my house, and... I stole money from my kid's piggy bank and I stole money from my wife. I knew she kept some cash and I grabbed two suits that didn't fit very well and I jumped in the car and I drove 12 hours to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Two things happened when I got there. I didn't have enough food. I didn't have enough money to, to eat food and to stay there. So the first night there, I didn't eat. They were, there was a group of people who had been, they had a meeting and they're they collecting pizza boxes and I went over to help them clean up. They thought I was so nice. I took some of the scraps to my room and ate leftover pizza that people didn't eat. The next morning I got up, this changed my life. Brian Pope was one of the owners of Symmetry. He was speaking on stage and he looked out of the room and this is the wealthiest guy in the room and he's talking about insurance. He's talking about things and I'm taking notes. And he says, you can make it here at Symmetry if you just don't quit. And I Mm. looked up. And he said it again. He said, listen, guys, this is not that hard. It's going to be one of the hardest things you've ever done, but it's not that hard. He said it again. You can make it if you just don't quit. And I started writing on the piece of paper, just don't quit. Just don't quit. And I look around, and this is the wealthiest guy in the room talking. Nobody else is writing. And I'm writing it again, just don't quit. Just don't quit. And I looked down and there's tears streaming out of my eyes. Just don't quit. Just don't, I'll make it if I just don't quit. I can beat 95%. I can beat the 92% if I just don't quit. You're right. And I'm writing that down. And I'm crying. Tears are soaking my And I said, I'm going to make it here. And I finally in my life made up my mind to not quit something. Because here's the thing, Cody. I would quit everything I'd ever started. Everything. I I'd quit on my family. I quit on my wife. I'd quit Prime Prime America. <laughs> I'd quit Farmers. Farmers. I quit Senior Life. I quit Aflac. I quit on friendships. I quit going to the gym. I quit on everything I'd ever done in my entire life. And the guy said, All you have to do to win is just don't quit. So two things happened that week and I became a man when they'd offer wouldn't give me money and I had to figure it out. I always tell people, I'm not looking for people that are res- that have resources. I'm looking for people that are resourceful. 
And that's the lesson Nate offered taught me. I became a man in that moment. You're glad he I didn't give home. you money. I'm glad he didn't give me the money. I had to stop blaming everyone else and say, I got to this point in my life because I was a failure or because I'd failed, not because I was a failure. See, I was broke. I wasn't poor. It's a mentality. Mm. And so when I found the money and I found a way, not eating, helping people so I could figure it out, I realized I was resourceful. I was eating pizza in that room and I was laughing. I was smiling because I thought, I can figure this thing out. That's if right. I can figure out how to eat and how to get across the country, and there are people in this room that have the resources, they have the talent, but they ain't going to work as hard as me. And mm -mm. Something switched. That moment when he said that and when, when Nate Offer did that, I drove home, literally drove up to the door. My wife had taken the kids to school and I met. I said, give me 90 days to prove my love for you and that this business works. And I drove off and I went to work. See, most people tell you that you're working. I wanted to show them what work looked like. Mm. And that, that changed. Wow. Wow. It's awesome that you can pinpoint these different times in your life that changed you because it's crazy to hear your story and hear over the last 43 years, 18 years, whatever you want to look at mm -hmm. and compare you probably even what, six years ago mm -hmm. to today yeah. is insane. Mm. And it should give a lot of people hope that watch. Yeah. That's all I want to give. I, I tell people that the one thing that you can take, you can take my money. The, the, the being broke wasn't the hardest part. The hardest part for me was being hopeless. See, most people think that the money, we, money's fluid. You can make money. Yeah. I could have went and worked at McDonald's. I could have found a way. But when you don't have hope, that's a scary place to be. And I was hopeless. If you have hope, you're going to make it. That's it, man. If, if you just have hope, you might not know how you're going to make it. You may not know when you may not know where you may not know why. If you have hope, you'll make it. Hope's the one thing you can't take from me. You, listen, you can beat me up. Don't mean I, I got, I was homeless sleeping in my car and I had hope because I knew that I had the secret ingredient. If I didn't quit, I knew I was going to make it. That's right. I didn't know it was going to happen as fast. So I'm, I'm going to circle way back around. Right. I didn't know it was going to happen. If I have, did I ever dream I was going to make this money? I always dreamed it, but I didn't realize what happened this fast. And it took a long freaking time too, though. You know? Um, it feels like it was yesterday that I was living in my car. Wow. I mean, let, let's talk about it. The one thing that I didn't have when I was broke was perspective. Yeah. Like now, I told you, I, I'm, I'm doing some intermittent fasting. Like when I was broke and I didn't eat till lunchtime, I felt sorry for myself because I thought I was hungry. Now I call it intermittent <laughs> fasting. <laughs> yeah, It's all about perspective. That's right. How do you look at things? And so then I was broke, but I still had my health. I was broke, but I still had friends. I was broke and I had a golden opportunity. It didn't matter. Listen, don't matter what company it is. Yeah. It really broke, doesn't. But I changed my perspective, and that's the thing that I think wealthy people have is they have a different perspective. I don't think I don't think they have more opportunity. I don't think they have more. I think they have more a different perspective. And yeah. for me, if I was upright, I was always going to be a father to my children. I was always going to fight for the love of my wife. But the perspective was, I got to go out here and win. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Start acting as if. Mm. So. You're not going to ask the question. I'll just, I'm, well, I'm going with it. No, you're good. <laughs> you go, this you is go, phenomenal. You <laughs> what, 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 was, what was your first year like um, with with Symmetry? You, you know, um, you came back. Mm -hmm. You said, I, you know, I want 90 days to prove myself. You went to work. You got serious. Mm -hmm. Walk us through these. Like, how, how, how long have you been with Nate? And I've been at Symmetry six and a half years, going on seven years. Okay. See, it's impressive when you're you're like, I was homeless three years ago. People are like, I'll be telling the story and I'm all, I was homeless 47 years ago. People yeah. are like, oh, I <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But uh, my first year with Symmetry was the hardest thing I'd ever done, but it was worth it. I always tell people, don't ask if it's hard, ask if it's worth it. So it was hard because there was a lot of things that, that were in me that had to come out that were bad. And there were a lot of good things in me that had to come out to create power and wealth. And, and so... Um, I had a lot of bad habits. I think if you look at any person, I'm, I'm talking to you and what I hear you talk about a lot, you're saying one thing, but I'm hearing it's habits, habits, habits. Hab I think all wealthy people have great habits. Mm -hmm. And so what I had to change was my bad habits. And so that first year, Nate Offred had a lot of great habits because he had a great mentor that I had to take and, and change. Um, what was the worst habit you had? 
that you've totally fixed and it's the complete opposite now? I don't know if I'll ever fix it because I think it's, it was so natural. I mean, it was so comfortable. We know that mm. comfort is where things go to die. I know where you're going. I'm a procrastinator. Hi, my name is Marlon. I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, that's, it is, it's, 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 it's human nature. It's, it's what everybody, you know. Well, I, I just hired Coach Michael Burt to work with me. He says something. He says things. The power of what he says, he talked about, he teaches his mind. The first person you negotiate with every morning is yourself. And I know I'm a procrastinator, so I wake up and I start to do things to keep me from procrastinating. If I don't, like sometimes on the weekends, I'm a procrastinator. Yeah. My wife's like, can you clean the this or can you go pick up stuff? And do I'll, it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow, baby. You know, <laughs> You know, I worked hard and the kids got basketball games and I'll get, I'm a procrastinator, but here's, here's what I know that there's pain that hurts and there's pain that alters. The pain that hurts is, is not being able to, to buy my son tennis shoes to play basketball. A story I tell is my daughter, we went to, well, I don't want to say the name of the store, went to a big store and I, I bought her these really inexpensive soccer shoes. They were $13. That's all I could afford. They ripped and they tore um, like two days later and I took them back and I yelled and screamed at a lady because I didn't have money to buy more. But oh. she said, I'll give you your money. She said, I'll give you a store credit. They didn't have any more of my daughter's size. And so I fought for 30 minutes to get money to go to the, another store to get shoes. The pain, that's pain that hurts. Pain that alters is when I would go to the refrigerator when I was living at home with my wife and my kids, and I'd look in the refrigerator and I'd count meals and I'd turn around and count kids and I'd have more kids than I had meals. That's the pain that alters. Mm. The pain that alters is I was sitting at a buddy's house drinking and, and, and playing video games as a 35-year-old gentleman and my wife calls me and we're on food stamps at the time and she says the food stamp card won't work. And I said, well, I'm busy. I need to figure it out. That's pain that alters you. So that first year, I ran towards, here's a good one. Okay, good. People, people may not get this. Um, the way to beat procrastination is to run towards pain. Gosh, I love that. I, I run towards things that I don't like to do. The reason I procrastinate is because I don't like to do them. L like the cold shower. Like the, co like the cold showers, which I'll tell that story in a minute. Mm -hmm. I run towards things. First thing in the morning, I get up. I meditate, I read a book, I listen to audio, I go to the gym, I come home and take a cold shower. Why? Because I have to trick my brain into doing something I don't want to do. Right. I've done it for a year now. Listen, it was 30 degrees in Oklahoma the other day. When, when, when it's 80 degrees outside you take a cold shower, man, it's a little discomforting. Dude. When it's 30 degrees and you take a cold shower, I become a woman in so many words. Like, I... <laughs> I'm in there cussing myself out. I don't want to do it, but I stay in there until I absorb it and I realize that I'm doing it and I stay in there until I enjoy it and then I get out. I can take a cold shower for five minutes or 30 minutes until I trick my brain into understanding why. My first year at Symmetry, I had to beat that demon of procrastination out of me. And I did it because I had a great mentor in Nate Alford. I had a great mentor in Brad Smith. I had a great mentor in Matt Smith. I had a great mentor, the number one guy at Symmetry Financial Group, Edward Pritchett. He's one of my biggest fans. He, this guy is by the buck. He does everything that he's supposed to do, but he told me I do them because I realize if I don't, it'll break me. Like I asked him one time, why do we read? Because we hear people, wealthy people read. I said, why do you read? He said, if I don't read, at some point the money's going to break me. So I, I forced myself to read. Now I substituted by listening to a lot of audios. But the first year at Symmetry, I had to get rid of a lot of bad habits. And I'm thankful for all those gentlemen I just named. A guy like Brian Delaney, who had no um, financial gain in my future, would take time on the phone with me. And they wouldn't yell at me and say, you're wrong, you suck. You, Hey, Marlon, have you ever thought that if you go do what you want to do, you can go do what you get to do? Mm. So these guys, I'm getting mentorship. And, and like you said earlier, I'm gravitating towards guys who have great energy, guys right. that are positive. Guys, I, I stopped the two most important decisions my mom told me you'll ever make is where you'll spend eternity and who you hang out with. Mm. Now, they say it different in success books. They say you're the, you're, your wealth is the equivalent of the five people that you hang around with. Well, Network is your net worth. Your yeah. network is your net worth. But here's the thing that I tricked. Most people don't believe that. Oh, 100, 100 and I didn't believe it either. I didn't either. I thought it was cheesy. I thought that was dumb. Well, that I, I can have my buddies. Yeah. 
that, that are working at Quick Trip, and, the, and the Quick Trip's a great company, but the, the, I can't get to where I'm getting to working at a cashier at Quick Trip. If I do, I better be doing something on the side. That's right. I can't get to where I'm getting to when you're going to 9 to 5, and you're happy for the weekends, and I'm waking up happy about Monday because I get to go get it. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy about Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. And I, I can't be around you because we don't have the same birds of the feather flock together. Yeah. So I realized when I started changing the people, it's it's the foundational thing in my life that I'm studying right now is you can change. This is the reason why. Listen, let me let me talk to some of you guys. Hi, my name is Marlon. I'm a procrastinator. Have you ever been to an event, some sort of event? You're, you're going to 10X uh, tomorrow. I leave tomorrow. It starts Friday. It starts Friday. Unbelievable. You're sitting second row. Second row. Can I say that? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. I called you to ask you how much money? Second row. Why? Association. If, if you ever gone to an event and you came home and you weren't really that changed, here, here's why I think it is. I don't know it all. I think the reason that you're not changed is because your mentality changed, but your environment didn't change. Wow. So when I go back and I'm an eagle and I've just been with a bunch of eagles and these guys are soaring high and they're rising above the storm, not running from it like a chicken and they're flying and they're on a cliff and you only see eagles by themselves. You don't see them with everybody else and you come back and you're on a bunch of chickens. At some point, if I'm around a bunch of chickens, what I do is not what they do and I want to fit in because I like being liked and I start doing chicken activities. Not that the event didn't change me. The event changed my mentality, but if I don't change my environment, it doesn't matter. It's absolutely true. So when I come back from events that first year at Symmetry, I changed my associations. And I have a lot of great friends. That doesn't mean I I kicked them to the curb. Right. That just means I spent more time with guys that had what I wanted. Smaller doses. Smaller doses, brother. I love you. Hey, we can go out. Let's go out next month and watch the fights. I'd love to do that. Yeah. Hey, can you come over tomorrow? Actually, I'm working. I'm at the office. I'm staying late. Hey, I got up at 3 o'clock this morning to read. It's 7 o'clock. I'm tired. And did you, you guys heard that, right? I got up at 3 o'clock. <laughs> like dude it's it's insane i freaking love it like i'm pushing myself a little harder recently because i've got my power five you mm-hmm. know 5 a.m club workout write goals learn and cold shower mm-hmm. and i wimp out of the cold shower every once in a while mm-hmm. you know when i heard 3 a.m mm-hmm. meditate for an hour mm-hmm. work out for an hour learn for an hour and and cold showers are nothing to me when i heard that in dallas at nate's event i'm like Dang, this dude's out. This dude's out working me. Mm. This dude's out doing me. You don't like that? No, I don't like that. <laughs> it's I, Cody Askins, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> dude, I hate it. I like, dude. Marlon Faulkner is. Uh, he's 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 legit. But here, here's why I heard Michael Phelps say one time they interviewed Michael Phelps. I'm, I'm not a big swimming fan. I can't even swim. I'll, I'll tell you that story. That that has to do with the cold shower. Okay. Um, but I heard him ask him. He won so many gold medals. He's he's number one in cold showers. I mean, not cold showers, but I'm number one in cold showers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he's number one in gold medals. Man. He was being interviewed. I didn't remember where I watched. I've looked for it. I can't find it. But I, I know that I saw it. When they ask him, how many days a week do you swim? Mm. And when he was, I think, five or six, I'm get, I'm going to bumble the story up, but just get the gist of it. He he talked to his mom, or maybe seven or eight, but he, he found out that high school athletes swim four days a week. The best high school athletes swim four days a week. He found out the best collegiate at- athletes swim five days a week. He found out that world-class Olympic gold medalists swim six days a week and take a day off. And so he made up his mind as a little boy, I'm going to swim seven days a week. Because he realized every year he was getting a day on his competition. So if I went from homeless, and I'm trying mm. to catch a guy like Cody Askins. I'm trying to catch a guy like Nate Offord. I'm trying to catch a guy like Edward Pritchett. I'm following guys like Brandon and Casey. I, I have to get up early because I'm at a disadvantage. Because I was 38 years old or 37 years old, and I was homeless. So if I don't get up early, I can never catch you. And there's people say, well, you don't have to get up early. You don't. I have to. Because I got four kids. I got a stupid cat that I don't like. And I got to be at the office. And, and my kids play sports four days a week, five days a week, six days a week. And I want to go to the gym and work out. Well, when do I get my time? That's right. See, Edward Pritchett taught me something. He said, you can't steal from your family time to give to your time. And you can't steal from your business time to give to your family. And you can't steal from your time to take from either of them. 
So he said, you mm. got to figure out one or two things because you only have 24 hours in a day. You only have 85,600 or whatever it is, seconds in a day. Yep. I can't steal from my wife and my kids. I was at a basketball game till 8 o'clock last night. When was I, I was going to get home and want to read. I was going to get home and want to go work out. I'm not saying I'm better than people. I got to get up. Yep. My wife rolled over the other day. She said, what time is it? I said, I don't know. Listen, I don't use an alarm clock. I heard Eric Thomas said, I thought he was crazy. I thought I was crazy. I thought if there's a creator that can create all this stuff, surely I can wake up without technology. Wow. So I don't, I, listen, I know my body. I know I can get five and a half hours of sleep. So if I'm in bed by 10 o'clock, 3.30, 3 o'clock is not that, it's not, it's really not that hard. Mm-hmm. If you know your body, it's, I'm not, I just know mathematics. I tell people, guys, it's not magic. It's math. <laughs> Go to bed at 10, get up at three. It's not hard. So I, I don't use Dang. an alarm clock. My, I beat my alarm clock. It's a game I play. It feels it's a good feeling. It's it's an unbelievable feeling because I get up and my my feet have to hit the ground in ten seconds, or what? I'll procrastinate and I'll lay there. What'll happen? Wow. I'll go back to sleep. I give myself ten seconds. How many people? How many people do you have on your team now? We we've lost some people. Again, we're we're around. We were at one hundred and fifty. We're probably down to about one hundred and twenty hundred. We we had an event. We had a hundred good people at the event. Because you are a master and I don't even think you really realize this yet you're a master recruiter promoter I learned from thank you for saying that too, too many times people let people talk about them again man I'm, I'm honored to be here I just want to be in your presence I just I just like you as a person right. without all this stuff this is just a bonus for me yeah but I appreciate you saying that. But I I learned from Nate Offert, from Matt and Brad Smith, and I, I paid attention. Here's why. Cause in, in, in our company, you can either be a great producer or a great recruiter. I wasn't a great producer. You hear how many years of experience I have in insurance. My first month, this is a, excuse me, sorry. My first month in symmetry and Nate offers first month. Nate offered zero insurance experience. Great with people, trained. He went out. He did fifty thousand. I've got fifteen years of experience. I did thirty eight hundred. <laughs> so here's what happened. My wife lets me back in the house. We salvage our relationship. We're working on. We're daily working on relationships. Still six years later, and but I remember sitting up one night and think I can't catch Nate Offer. Mm. I don't know if I'll ever be able to write. 50,000 in a home in, in a month I mean but he told me Brad Smith said this one time he said the greatest promoters are the highest paid people here's That's what right. most people don't understand I, I think I won't say that because that sounds here's what I didn't understand it doesn't have to be about you I can promote symmetry I can promote Nate Alford, I can promote Brad Smith. I can promote Edward Pritchett. I can promote Matt Smith. I can promote guys that are better than me. And what does that do that takes the focus off of me? Because that's what people want to know. Yeah. I was a homeless guy. How, yeah. how do you recruit me when you're homeless? Yeah. Because here's the number one question people ask. Well, how are you doing in the business? Mm. And Nate Alford taught me to ask a question. When you were in elementary school, when you, you remember the last day of school when the teacher would line, they always have a fun day or some sort of day. It was the best day of the year for me. And they would line everyone up and see who the fastest kid was. Mm. And then Alfred said, when the teacher shot the gun off or blew the whistle, did you look around to see how fast everyone else was running? I said, no. He said, what'd you do? I said, I ran as fast as possible. And so when people would ask me, well, how good are you doing? I say, you remember the last day of school when you had teacher? That's good. Uh, what's something else? What, what if what if someone came up to me and said, hey, how are you doing at your, at your job? I said, well, uh, I'm doing okay. I, I don't know. It's still kind of working out for me. And, and they said, well, I'm going to wait and see if you do good. Exactly. At that That's the same as saying, hey, Cody, you're married. I'm thinking about getting married to my wife. I'm engaged. I'm going to watch you and wait to see how good your marriage is. And then if your marriage doesn't work, I'm not going to get married. That's how much sense that makes. Yeah. Here's really what they're saying. I'm scared of the unknown. Mm-hmm. And if you can do it, I think maybe I can do it. But here's what happened. They would never do it. Everyone who said that to me would never do it. Why? Because they thought I got lucky. They thought I knew something that they didn't. Or they thought it was a scam. That logically in their brain like I used to make excuses they had to make an excuse as to why they couldn't have success that I was yeah. having that that's the same thing 
I did, when I would look at successful people, money was evil. What are my thoughts about money? Because thoughts are things. Is that person evil? What did he have to steal to get it? The, the, the rich exactly. people are greedy. I was thinking all these thoughts. So what I was doing was saying, I'm scared. Mm. I don't know if I can do it. I'm scared of the unknown. There's, there's a fear in me. You have people. Re- you have people around you that have known you throughout your life that probably reach out all the time, don't you? More now because I'm more private. I like. Yeah, you're not. That's if you were more public on your Instagram and everything else, you definitely would. But yeah, yeah, I'm more private because I don't. I don't necessarily want the fame. I want to help people. Well, dude, I was bragging on you a second ago, and you deflected it. That's um, what. That's what truly humble people do. Yeah, because I don't. That's not. I don't want the fame. I, I know the kind of world we live in now. If I can help one person, my life was worth living. Wow. If I can help one person, what that guy who drove the Mercedes, he changed my life. He didn't know it. If I can help one person change a life, because that change will be generational for my children's yeah. children's children's children. Because a man made a statement to me that clicked. If I can be a conduit, I didn't have to take the credit for it. If I can say something that I, someone that I never ever get to meet and right. it changes their life, I'm good. That, that that's why I like to talk. That's why I like to speak. That's why I love doing what I'm doing. Um, I know people. I want to see everyone reach the best version of themselves, and I, I'm trying to reach the best version of mine. I'm not perfect. Just call my wife. Call the cat. Call the. I mean, I'm allergic to the cat. And that thing tries to be around me. I think at some point we're gonna gain a friendship but we're mm-hmm. working me and the cat are working I feed him so he loves me but I don't like him but because uh, <laughs> no one else will feed him it's weird anyways somebody's got to do someone's it someone's got to do it I'm not uh, I'm not a glutton for pain I, I want the cat to eat because I like to eat but we're on this rock called earth for a moment and I, I, I read this in Les Brown's book and it, it, I just read this yesterday. And it's like wow. become my life's mission that I want to live a life that's going to outlive me. Mm. How do I do that if I can't get up? And how do I do that if I can't hold myself accountable? How do I do that if I'm taking all the credit and thinking I'm something when I'm still yeah. just a homeless guy who who fought for his family? That's all I am. All the, you wash everything. I'm a, I'm a homeless guy that wanted to fight. That was almost divorced. That wanted to fight for his kids to love him one day. That that's it. That's all, that's all I am. All that you can take that, and that's the pain that 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 anguishes. That's the pain that torments. That's all I am. Everything else is just a just a picture of just a guy that wants to be with his wife and kids. That's why your story is just so incredible. From homeless, struggling the insurance industry specifically for mm-hmm. so many years, mm-hmm. to the amount of money you're making now, yeah, is truly remarkable. And, and and you're still, you will still 10x the amount of money you're making now. 100%. We won't, I won't say how much money I make. We're, we're high five figures. We're, we wanna, we're going to close it on six figures a month this year. That's amazing. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I was sitting in bed with my wife and like you guys have to understand, we, I bought my wife a house and I'm going to build her dream house. We bought a house that fits all of us. My father-in-law passed away, so it's seven of us in this house. We all have room. Like before I couldn't burp without someone saying, excuse me, and they'd be like three rooms away. And so we were in a 1,700 square foot house, six people. Um, now I think it's 4,500, 5,000 square feet. But um, what were you, what'd you say? Cause it, well, we were talking about, um, the, yeah, I do, I do it all the time. I'm talking about the amount of money um, and oh, it's going so from high going. five figures to you oh yeah, 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 six yeah. Some of the house. I talked about the house. Yeah. So it was in November. We had the biggest month we've ever had in our lives, and I woke up and in one day we had something like thirty thousand deposited in our bank account, and that was all in overrides. That wasn't. I don't, I've written a policy in three or four years, wow. and my wife and I started crying because that was more money I'd made in a year ever in the insurance industry. I made in one day, and I'll never forget. Brian Delaney did a call. And, he remembered the day that he made more money in a month than he made in a year and more money in a day than he made in a year. And that's a humbling experience. Like you have to understand, me and my wife, we're big crybabies. We were crying because like when we moved into this house, we have our own bathroom now. My wife has her own tub with the shower. And we have Legit, her, own, her your own separate bathroom? We have our own separate bathroom. Wow. And so we were... 
Don't let my wife hear that. I was crying. Or, or do. <laughs> I was crying because three years ago we had, and I was in symmetry. Let's, let's talk maybe six years ago when I just moved back in. Yeah. We were all sick one time. We all had to, you know, when you have big families, when one person gets sick, everyone, like if one person goes to the doctor with strep throat, we go get everybody the, the medicine. I'm like, they're all going to get it, doc. Just That's right. give me the meds. I'm not trying to overdo the meds and just give me the meds, doc. And, but we were all sick and our bathroom that my wife and I had in our room didn't, didn't work. We couldn't afford to fix it. So the toilet didn't work. The shower didn't work. Mm. The sink was, it was the house she grew up in. My in-laws moved out when her, her grandma passed away. We lived in that house. We didn't even, this is the first house I've ever bought. Wow. And my kids were, we all had the stomach bug and between vomiting and diarrhea, there was a point when I had to go outside to vomit because there was nowhere else. There was only one bathroom. And there was a line for people to diarrhea or vomit to go from that. So listen, you, you didn't talk about what you want to talk about. If something happens and I can go to my own bathroom, it's still humbling to me. That, that's I'm still, there are people still don't have that. So when I wake up every morning, I'm, I'm grateful. And sometimes when I'm meditating, I'll just find one thing to be grateful for, for 30 minutes. And that morning, it was just having a bathroom that my wife and I can share in privacy with our kids. Yeah, um, I get chills listening to you tell stories like that. It's I, I don't take it for granted, man. I'm, I'm blessed. No, you don't. And you still work and show up like you're homeless. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't I don't see it changing. That's good. I never thought about that. I never thought of. Dang it. You said it first. <laughs> you said it first. That's good. Dude. Um, I mean, did, how you show up, the time you wake up, the meditating, the learning, the working out, the cold shower, the mentorship that you still crave, the people you spend time, like, like all the things you're doing, those are the secrets. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, everybody that watches it, we've got 13,000 and change insurance agents that watch our stuff pretty mm -hmm. consistently. Awesome. And most of them are Marlon Faulkner six years ago. Mm. They're Marlon Faulkner 10 years ago. Yeah. They're Marlon Faulkner 18 years ago. Mm. And they're struggling. Mm. They're not making any money. They're thinking about quitting. They don't know what to do. Mm. They don't know who to sell with. They think like there's some magic company, company. or some magic yeah. lead or some magic potion that you can sprinkle on them that... that yeah. And what, what, what I hope they get out of this and why I was so excited about this today, and you can see my energy pick up, <laughs> is that it isn't the product they're selling. Mm -mm. It isn't the commission they're earning. Mm -mm. It isn't the company they're with. Mm -mm. It isn't the experience they have. It is those little things that you're doing mm -mm. that have changed you. You went to a conference. Like, I'm going to get 8,000 excuses of why most of these people won't come to 8% Nation. Mm. You went anyway. Mm -hmm. No money. Mm -hmm. No gas. No mm -hmm. food. Couldn't afford a ticket. Mm -hmm. You knew it was going to change your life. Mm -hmm. And you showed up and you went anyway. Like Art Williams, just mm -hmm. do it. You did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And most of the people in our business won't wake up. Like, like I, I tell people, like you talk about. Everyone has desire. Everyone wants to be successful. Everyone wants to give to charity. Everyone wants to make a lot of money. Everyone wants to make six figures a month, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But very few people adopt, very few people put their ego aside mm. and adopt the discipline to show up and go get it every day. Mm. And that's why I love spending time with you. Yeah. You're going to elevate me and take me to another level, whether mm. you realize it or not. You think I'm going to take you, and I, that ain't going to happen. It's going to be you mm. that's going to take me to another level because... I don't wake up at 3 a.m. Mm. I don't work out for an hour. I don't meditate for an hour. I don't read for an hour. I don't yeah. take cold showers every day like I should. I don't crave mentorship like I should. I go to a lot of events and I do a lot of things, but that's the secret mm. that I hope they take away from today and listen to you talk. Man, um, I appreciate you saying that. Here it is in a nutshell. Um, man, that's good. I hope it wakes somebody up today, man. Just one, man. Just, take Just one. one person. Um, everything that I've ever done since 
starting in symmetry. I, I'm I'm telling you, I'm going to do great things. I'm, I'm telling you, it's it's not if, it's just when. But yeah. Um. Here's the difference. Because you do all that, and now it's it's just different habits. I don't because I don't think taking a cold shower is extraordinary. I just something I do. We didn't get to the cold shower story. We'll come back. We'll get that next. <laughs> we'll get that next time. But um, when I <clears throat> when I walked in the door last night. My wife came up and kissed me. My kids came up and hugged me. I went from being ashamed of who I was to proud of who I am. Hmm. That's it. That's worth it to me. When, when I look in the mirror, I'm proud of who I'm becoming. And I, I used to not look in the mirror because I was ashamed. I can't wake up every morning and go back because I like the man that I'm becoming. And more than that, my kids Gosh. look at me and my wife looks at me and they've watched the struggle. They're old enough to know I was homeless. They're old enough to know about the molestation. They're old enough to know that my dad, would he beat me unconscious when I was, I mean, I got story after story after story, but when I walk in my door at night, when I lay my head down, my wife and kids are proud of me. And uh, my, my kids go to private school now. It costs 50000 a year mm. for my kids to go to private school. <laughs> they know the sacrifice that I'm making. Not about the schools, not about the money. They know that daddy will do everything he says he's going to do. Yeah, And they're going to watch me struggle some more and get better. They're going to watch me struggle some more and get better. At the end of my life, when I, I get hit walking across the street or my wife and kids being proud of me brother it's worth it I'll work harder totally I, I heard Ed Milet I listen to Ed a lot and I heard him say that he didn't want to die and get to heaven and the Lord introduces him to this man that's unfamiliar and that was the man that he should have been and wow. I don't know if I could accept not being the man that I should be because I want to get right. sleep or because I can't be disciplined not to eat, or I can, I'm too selfish or, or not humble enough. I've got to go help people regardless of the income. The income, money never leads; it always follows. I've got to go win so that I can meet that man one day and look in the and it's like looking in the mirror because I know what he looks like. And for 37 years of my life, if I would have died, I would not know who that man was because wow. I I knew this was possible. I just didn't know what it looked like. So is that is that why you? This is really this is really unique, um, and we're almost we're, we got we're, we got a few more minutes. We'll wrap up quickly. But there's, I've I don't think I've ever met anyone that almost like craves pain, like you do. It's almost like you 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 like crave it and want to go through it because you know you've seen how far you've came because you did a lot of things that you didn't want to do, mm. and, and it's like. Dude, it's special. Well, everything I equate to a video or a book, because every time you say a word, I'm thinking videos. Um, <laughs> That's because you're so you're always learning, man. Yeah, Ray, Ray Lewis has a, a video called Pain oh. is Temporary. Eric Ooh. Thomas has a video called Pain is Temporary. I, I crave pain or I run towards it because I have a lot of hurt in my life. Um, I tell people when I started at Symmetry Financial Group, People think it's hard. It wasn't hard to me because it's just, you got to go fail a lot to get good. And I failed at everything in my life. So coming to December, it wasn't hard. I can promote and recruit because I knew I wasn't a good writer, but I could fail. People could tell me no, and I could run and, and, and fall down and skin my knees and get up again because I failed at everything I'd ever done. Yeah. Pain is just understanding that if pain is temporary, if I can get to the other side of it, it's not a pain anymore. It was just an obstacle. Right. Most people look at pain as permanent. Mm -hmm. Pain is not pain; it's temporary. So if I, the first time I took a cold shower, because I was watching, uh, I, I don't just watch TV. I was watching Netflix, but I was watching Tony Robbins, "You Are Not My Guru," and and he got the little things like this. People miss. He got out of bed. He was talking. He jumps in this cold plunge, that's freezing, and he got out and he went on his day. 
57 degrees. 57 degrees. That's something I'm not doing. And then I was talking with Edward Pritchett, and we went to Dorado Beach, where my symmetry takes us on trips every year. Uh, two years ago, my wife and family, we went on 10 vacations, a little bit much now. I told my wife, can we just stay home for Christmas this year? <laughs> like, we're in Puerto Rico for 90. Can we just stay home? Um, but Edward Pritchett, they had this thing in there, this cold plunge, and I couldn't stay in the cold plunge for more than two minutes. Mm. And I said, why? Because of pain. It was hard on my body. It was, it was hard. Yeah. And this year we were back in Puerto Rico and I was in there about 30 minutes. Wow. Why? Because pain is temporary. You can teach your body to do anything. That's right. When I, when I was living the life that I was living as a child, I would have to close my brain off when things were happening to me that were painful. I would close them off and overcome and I still go to school smiling. I still wake up and go to football practice. I didn't use that as an excuse. So now if something is painful, like making phone calls or cold calling or recruiting an agent, or I just put it in my brain, this is only temporary, make it do it and it won't be here anymore. And so I, I look for pain. Why? Because the 92% won't. I take cold showers. Why? Because the 92% won't. If I just do what the 92% people won't do, then I'll have what the 8% has. It's not rocket science. I just have to do what, other, if I if I want to go work a nine to five, I'll have what people who work nine to five make. I'll have the lifestyle that they have, the houses that they have, the cars that I'm driving my kids to go to school where their kids go to school. If I want what the 8% has, I got to go do what the 8% do. I have to have better habits. I've got to run towards pain. I've got to fail quicker, fail fast. I was just listening to, you got me on Grant Cardone. He said, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Why? Mm. Because it's not a failure anymore. It's just an obstacle. And it's funny to look back at all the things that I thought were painful that were just like litty bitty speed bumps. Like picking up a phone and calling a friend that that's in pain because they're living a life from nine to five. They don't get to see their family. They don't make enough money. They have to stay, take stay vacations. And I was too painful. It was too painful for me to call them and tell them about the opportunity at Symmetry. It's insane that most people won't do that, though. <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy. It's, yeah, it is crazy. It's crazy. Can I tell the story real quick? Please, so please. I, so I can't swim. People get on me about this. So I, this is two years ago. You still ago. can't swim? I still can't swim, but I'm, I'm, I heard uh, Grant Cardone said, if you can't swim, go take some strokes. I just heard that yesterday. So I'm calling. Now listen, I called the YMCA, and this only answered, and I asked him about swim lessons. She said, well, I'm the one that teaches. I said, all right, I'll call you later. Bye. Like, I don't want an old lady teaching me, but because I almost drowned as a kid. So it's a phobia. It's a fear. I almost oh, drowned. Oh, my. So it's not that I just didn't learn to swim. But sure. We went to Puerto Rico last year because we took a cruise and we stopped in Puerto Rico so I went to see my mentor because he has a house there. And we were at this kiddie site. He said, you want to go to the kiddie park? So yeah, I've got five, four kids. You've got four kids. And so we went to this kiddie park and I'm thinking kiddie park. Now when you go to Dorado Beach, look it up sometimes. It's yeah. like paradise. And their kiddie park was like Disney World. Wow. But it's on, their, it's on their, where they live at. And he says, well, let's go down the slide. I can't swim. I've never gone on a water slide in my life. And I look up and I see these stairs going up and then there's some clouds and I can see some more stairs going up and he's, he starts walking. So I think, I guess I'm going down the slide. So I walk, start walking up the stairs and I pass the Sherpa on the way. And you know, it's like climbing Mount Everest going up this thing and I get to the top and I can look down to me. It looked like I was at the top of Mount Everest to kids. It's probably, 40, 50 feet up. It's a big slide. Yeah. You've never been on, I was, I'm a 42-year-old man at the time. I've never been on a water slide. Wow. And he's like, all right, we're going to go down the slide. Now, there's a slide on his side. There's a slide on my side. His slide's got rainbows and butterflies and birds, and it's an open slide. And mine's dark, and it's got bats and spider webs. And he's like, you go down that slide. I'm like, uh-uh. I want to go down that slide. He said, no, if you go down that slide, you'll never go down that slide. Listen to what he taught me. So we sit down and we're ready to go down the slide and my heart's racing. I think I'm going to die. I'm going to take in water. I've almost drowned before. I remember that feeling. I remember that fear. I'm not mm. going to do it. And he's like, one, two, three, go. And I don't let go. And I look over and he didn't let go. He said, you didn't let go. I said, you didn't let go. And he's like, well, you got to let go first. I said, you let go first. And so we're sitting there banning back and forth. I turn around. There's this five-year-old girl tapping her foot like this, waiting for me. So I get up and I let, there's a line of kids that are built up and they're going down the side having the time of their lives. And then it's all, all the kids are gone. So he's like, okay, here we go again. We sit back down and my heart is racing now. I'm thinking every negative thought I can think. And I'm like, I can't do this. And he said, yes, you can. 
I didn't want to tell him what my fear was. I'm thinking I'm going to drown. I'm going to take in water. When you came out the side, you stood up. It was about waist deep. I know people think this is silly. Follow me, please. Mm. He looks at me. This is why Edward Pritchett is one of my best friends, one of the greatest mentors I've ever had. He said, what would you tell one of your agents to do if they were scared? That did it. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about, I'm, oh. I'm thinking you're talking about death and writing a policy. But in my brain, I realize when people don't do things, why they're scared. And that was me. And so I let go. And it was the scariest thing I'd ever done in my entire life. Like I'm trying to stop. I'm going down the side. I'm using my elbows to try to slow down. I end up turning over. I'm in the water going down the side face first. I'm thinking I'm going to drown. I turn myself back over. I'm going through the sides. I'm turning. And I come out. And I, I just stand up on my feet. And I stand up. And I feel like I just conquered the world. And my son and my and my wife and Edward, they kind of roll their eyes like, Congrats. what took you so long? And they walked off. Here's the moral of the story. 95% of you that are watching this can swim and you think, what is he so scared of? Scared of? What is he afraid of? That's how I look at you when I look at this business. Mm. You know how silly it is that people think I can't swim? I think it's silly you won't get up at three in the morning. I think it's crazy that you won't get up and read to make yourself better. I think it's absurd that you won't get up and take a cold shower and work out. I, I, I think that, that you don't that you don't write down your thoughts for that. I think it's I think it's mind boggling that people don't do that. Just like they look at me because I can't swim. And you know what they'll say? Yeah, but everybody can swim. You know what I say? Yeah, there's a lot of money in the world. But here's what I told a guy the other day. I need a tissue. My nose Jeez. Yeah, you guys can you grab one. Man, I don't, I don't want to wipe it on camera. Yeah, you're right. They'll be like, that's out there forever. And I'm not, Marlon's wiping his nose. That'll be on a blooper reel somewhere. So I'm going to hide my nose like this. And <laughs> if it drips, it drips. I can't help it. Yeah, but um, I told the guy, here's the crazy part I'll learn how to swim and you'll still be broke mm. because you won't overcome your fears. Wow. What do you say? Because <laughs> that's good, dude. Like, that's good. I mean, I, I, there's people that are watching this that I'll jump in while you're doing this. There's people that uh, I'm going to make watch this. Mm, I don't care if I got to, like, drive to Alabama and sit them down and, and, and turn it on. Like, there are people that I'm going to make watch this. Yeah, don't get me wrong. There's still fears. But when I was five years old, I was scared that there was monsters in the closet. I'm not scared of that anymore. The bigger you get, the bigger fears you have. I still have fears, mm -hmm. but I'm going to run towards them. I'm going to learn how to swim, Yeah. but if you don't change what you're doing, you'll still be broke. That's what I tell people now. Listen, I'll learn how to swim. Call me in a year. Hey, I may still not know how to swim, but if you don't change what you're doing either, you're still going to be broke. What's okay. worse? Learning how to Listen, I go on boats all the time. I'm going on a cruise. Our company's renting out this big old, the biggest ship in the world, the Oasis of the Seas. I'll be on a boat, and we're going to an island. I was... And I kind of did swim this this last trip we went on with the Pritchett Agency. I was in the in the ocean, which I didn't know that. This is things you don't know if you don't swim. I didn't know that you could float easier in salt water. So I was out there, and I walked out with my wife and some friends, and I was at the point when I could barely the water was up to here, and I could barely touch. I'm six three. I'm a big guy, and I took a step, and I couldn't touch anymore. And I relaxed, and I remembered hold your breath and you'll float, and just take strokes, and. I did that all the way back to shore. I just relaxed, took a big breath, and I floated. Now, here's the crazy part. Last summer, I tried to do that in my buddy's pool, and I sank through the bottom. <laughs> no one told me that you can, you can float in salt water, you can in regular water, but hmm, I didn't I'm, know that. I'm going to get there. Yeah. I'm going to learn how to swim. If that's the worst thing that happens in my life, I've lived a pretty good life. Yeah, that's right. But if you don't overcome your fears, what is it costing you? That's good. That's good, man. This is good, bro. Any final words? This is good. Hmm. There's somebody out there watching that's struggling. They're thinking about quitting. They're 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 new. You know, uh, we get more new insurance. I think we've had. I think Dylan said we get like uh, about a hundred brand new insurance agents that subscribe to our channel because of one just one video we put out. Hmm. You know, so. Yeah, I'll tell a story. Um, I love to close. It's gonna be a good one. Good. Um, Pull at the heart. 
I, I, I watched, I love watching movies. I love military movies. My dad was in the military. I feel like I missed something part of my life because I didn't have that. My, uh, number one, hats off. If you were ever in the military, yep. someone in your family is in the military, hats off. Thank you for serving. No doubt. Because freedom isn't free. You paid the price that I could be here sitting in this chair. Amen. So thank you for your service. Thank you so much. That's good. Um, totally agree. But I was watching Lone Survivor with Mark Wahlberg, and it was about the Navy SEALs and Jacob Luttrell, I think. Yep. And uh, it's one of my favorite movies. Good. Uh, it goes through Navy SEALs, what they call Hell Week, and they, like, sleep. You're sleep deprived. They don't feed you. They're screaming at you. They're trying to break you down. But the crazy part is every time that someone quits, you have to go and you have to ring the bell to let them know that you're quitting. And I wish that I could institute in, on my team that every time someone came in and they committed to work this business and they committed to change their family's lives, I wish they would have to ring the bell. Now listen, that you go, from what I understand, almost days without sleep. You've got to eat within five minutes. They feed you. And then you got to run off and go. And then you're doing exercises physically all day long. And at the end of the day, they're going to push you one last time, and that's when most people quit. I, I heard that they, they take you out to a pier, and you got to sit in the water with your brothers, and, and you're doing it together, but some people can't take it because they don't know if you're going to be out there five minutes or five hours. Mm. Here's my favorite part of the movie. They started with like 200-some-odd guys, and they ended up with like 12 to 15, 20 guys. That make it through that? That make it through Hell Week. They become wow. Navy SEALs. And, you know, and please forgive me if, if you're a Navy SEAL. I'm, I'm just talking about the movie, what I know from it, and why I love this. Because I'm honored that those guys get to serve. They cho choose to serve. But at the end of that part, when everyone else is gone, they nail your, your, your wings to you that signify you make it, and you get to ring the bell. And I'll never forget, this is in my mind. I think about this all the time. One of the guys rings the bell, and he screams, it pays to be a winner. It pays to be a winner. It pays to be a winner. Yeah, it does. It pays to be a winner. For my kids, it pays that I'm a winner. For my wife, it pays that I'm a winner. For my grandchildren, it pays to be a winner. For my kids that I never meet, it pays to be a winner. For the team of people coming up, following me, it pays that I'm a winner. It pays to be a winner. Yes, it does. If I could teach people one thing, Cody, man, it'd be that they wouldn't quit because it pays to be a winner. That's good. That's good. Man. Thank you, buddy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm grateful. I can't wait to get to know you and your wife more. And just, just so as impressed well. that I will say this, that you walked in the room the first time I met you. And I didn't know it was you. I'd seen videos. I'd seen you on, on Facebook. And I'd seen your stuff, but I didn't know it was you because you're so humble. For someone that has achieved as much as you have in this little amount of life that you have, I will be by your side to watch you achieve so much more. Because I'm, 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 I'm on it. I get it. And to watch you has over the last, I mean, it's been like a month, but I feel like we've been <laughs> friends forever. Um, mm -hmm. I'm grateful that you allowed me to come up here. I'm grateful you answered my texts. I'm grateful to be a part of your life. And just to watch you win, I, I'll tell you from the bottom of my heart, it pays to be a winner. Thank it you does. for being you, sir. Thank you, bro. You too. You too. Go follow this dude. Go to follow this dude. Marlon Faulkner. Look him up on Facebook, look on Instagram. Stalk him, watch him. Uh, he, I'm telling you, he when he says it pays to be a winner, this dude's a winner. Hey, if you love this video and you want to get your phone skills up, I got the video for you how to nail the first 30 seconds of a call. Go right there, click on that video, and I'll see you there. Hey, insurance phone calls are tough. Nobody wants to pick up the phone. Everybody struggles to do this. And I'm going to show you how to nail the first 30 seconds of an insurance phone call right now. There's several mistakes.